anybody allowing their actions to reveal the Christ, the glory of the Lord. I, I believe it's crucial that we get to a place where it's not about give me, give me, give me, what can the Lord do for me, but rather it's about what can I do for the Lord, amen? So Matthew 6, 1 through 15 says, be very careful not to do your good deeds publicly, to be seen by men, otherwise you will have no reward prepared and waiting, awaiting you with your Father who is in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor and do acts of kindness, do not blow a trumpet before you to advertise it as the hypocrites do, like actors acting out a role in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored and recognized and praised by men. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, they already have their reward in full. Listen, when you glorify the Lord, the glory is his, it's not yours. Amen? But when you give to the poor and do acts of kindness, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give in complete secrecy so that your charitable acts will be done in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Also, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray publicly standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets so that they may be seen by men. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, they already have their reward in full. But when you pray, does it say if you pray? It says when you pray. If you're a Christian, you should be praying. You should be praying every day. Go into your most private room, close the door, and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. So do not be like them praying as they do, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Letting go of both the wrong and the resentment. In other words, you can't say I forgive you, but I'm going to remember that. <laughs> and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. In other words, if you don't forgive, he doesn't forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, nurturing your hurt and anger with the result that it interferes with your relationship with God, then your father will not forgive your trespass. I want to talk today, I want to start a series called The Kingdom. Because God has been purifying us, cleansing us, so that we can manifest his kingdom. But if we don't know what his kingdom is, how can we manifest it? If we don't understand the culture of his kingdom, how can we manifest it? If we don't know what it is that he means by manifesting his kingdom, there's no way we can manifest it. And what do I base that on? The Bible says my people perish because of a lack of knowledge. If you don't know the kingdom, how can you manifest the kingdom? If you don't know a song, how can you sing it? I'll make it plain. <laughs> Amen. And so... How many of you have ever had a situation that continues to recur over and over and over again? And you try to deal with the situation, but for some reason it continues to happen. Anybody, anybody been there? If, if you don't raise your hand, you're a liar. <laughs> and liars don't get into heaven. So everybody's hand should be up, right? It's okay, don't worry about your neighbor. Uh, we're all here to learn and be perfected into the image of Christ. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So, so why isn't the situation being resolved? Why isn't that thing that happens in our life uh, going away? Why do we continue to return to it? 
It's because we are always dealing with the fruit instead of dealing with the root. And until you deal with the root of that thing, it will always produce fruit. If you go out to a backyard and you cut off all the fruit, it will give fruit again next year because the root is still intact, right? How many of you know that we are engrafted to the body of Christ? In other words, we were a cut off shoot. That shoot was put onto the vine called Jesus. And because we were put onto the vine, we can now produce the fruit of Jesus because Jesus is the root of that vine, right? And, and so if you continue to deal with something in your life, the issue isn't the fruit, right? See, you may, you may have an addiction problem and you keep trying to fight that addiction problem. The, the addiction isn't the problem. The addiction is the fruit. The problem is that there's a root on the inside of you that tells you you're unworthy. The problem, there is a, 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 a seed, a root on the inside of you that's telling you you are worthless. That's telling you that you can't do it without that thing. And so we try, we have a tendency to go after the fruit because we can see the fruit and we can't see the root. But today, I, I want to speak to you about uh, two people um, who who were building a house. Two people who were building a house, two people who heard the same word, two people who went to the same church, two people who had to endure the same storm, two people that built from the same place, but yet their foundation was different, and one house was torn down and the other was not. Have you ever looked around the room and said, but why are they progressing and I'm not? Oh, y'all know y'all do that. So. <laughs> Have you ever looked at your brother and sister and said, but man, I'm praying and they're not answering my prayer. I, I, I'm not getting my prayers answered and, and they're getting their prayers answered. I don't understand, Lord. We've been there. <laughs> I, I hope to help you today because you see, as God has been cleansing us to purify us unto holiness, it's for one purpose alone, and that's to manifest his kingdom. And if you don't understand his kingdom, then you're not going to manifest his kingdom. If you still know your old nature, your old man, then that's what you're going to manifest. And so how many of you know that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind? So you could be in the presence, but not be transformed. See, the presence will seal the renewing of your mind, but it will not renew your mind. Because people seek the presence. People will come to church to feel the presence, and then they go out and they continue to do the sin that they live in. People came last weekend, and they were cleansed and purified. But how do you keep that cleansing? How do you keep that purity? It's all about your foundation. And so today I want to talk to foundation. Let's go back to Matthew 6, verse 9 and 10. Matthew 6, verse 9 and 10. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Number one, hallowed there um, is, is a particular word uh, that means that you're glorifying God. It means that you're putting him first. Amen? And then verse 10, it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we want his kingdom to come, if we're going to strive for his kingdom to come, we must know his kingdom. Amen? It's easy for people who come from a country um, like England or a country that was once ruled by England to understand kingdom. It is not easy for people of the United States of America to understand kingdom because we've never had a king. And so it can be very difficult. How many of you know if you're born in the United States of America, you're a citizen of the United States of America? And how many of you were born again? Amen. So you're a citizen of the kingdom. Yeah. So now you've got to learn a whole different culture. You've got to learn a whole different way of doing things. And we've got to allow God to do that to us. Amen? Amen. We've been cleansed, purified unto holiness for the purpose of manifesting his power to expand his kingdom. The kingdom of God must become the foundation of our lives. But how do we do that? How do we do that? 
I'll tell you, we've all had some rotten fruit in our lives. <laughs> all of our families have some rotten fruit. This state has some rotten fruit. This nation has some rotten fruit. Amen? And, and, and money is being spent to take care of this rotten fruit, but until we get to the root, ain't nothing going to get taken care of. And I believe that God has called us to get to the root of things in this region. I was, when I was preparing uh, this word, one of the things that the Lord kept showing me is that his body needs to move as one. And I said, but Lord, we all have different assignments, so how do we all move as one? He said, because at the word, at the mention of my word, at the doing of my word, you, be, you begin to move as one. Because my word is one. His word was summed up into one name. His name is Jesus. And so when we do his word, we're doing Jesus. And so I began to see, I went to a, a thing they call BNOC um, in the army. It's where they train you how to be a, a, a non-commissioned officer, a sergeant, and, and they teach you how to march, right? So come, Jose. Come, Omar. I'm going to, come, Richie. Let's see if we could do this, right? Go up on the altar. Let me see. Are you guys pure? Yeah, you're pure. Go on the altar. <laughs> <laughs> so... So I, I want you to see how, how easy it is to do this. So you two go over there. And you come over here, face that way. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call out left, right, left, right. And you're just going to walk left, right, left, right. Okay, while you're walking, you're going to swing your arms, okay? It's real easy. You'd be surprised how easy it is. You ready? One, two, three. Left, right, left, right. You're already wrong. When I say left, your foot should be hitting left. See, look, left, right, left, right, left, right. Okay? Don't worry, I'm going somewhere. Y'all with me? Yes. All right. Don't get lost in the sauce. All right? You ready? So as soon as I, okay, you ready? Watch, watch me. Left, right, come with me. <laughs> and y'all should be watching and learning. You ready? One, two, three. Left, right, left, right, left, right. Okay, see that? Okay, now you're gonna do it by yourself. Okay? Come over here so we could do more. All right, you ready? One, two, three. Left, left, right, left. See how I had to change? I'm, I'm, I'm showing you something. You saw me show him, right? You saw me show him, you saw me do it with him. And he's still not getting it, so he's still a step off, right? That's what some of us do with God. He's telling us to do something, and we don't want to do it the way he's telling us to do it. We're not getting the way he's telling us to do it. And so sometimes we'll keep doing what is wrong, thinking we're doing right. But no matter what, when you start doing it wrong, you're not doing his word anymore. And so now your foundation is off. And anything you build off of that foundation is going to be taken by the next storm. And that's why trouble comes and we forget that we serve Christ. Because our foundation isn't on Christ, it's on our own accord. And when the storm comes, you will always go to your foundation. I don't care who you are, what you are. I'll give you an example. If somebody cuts you off today and you still revert to the F-U or the S-H, then your foundation is still in the F-U and the S-H. It's not in Christ. Don't worry, I didn't curse. I just said letters. Y'all know what it is. Whatever you revert to is where your foundation is. When your wife gets you mad... If you revert to pornography, your foundation is in sexual immorality. When your husband gets you mad and you think about your ex, your foundation is still in your ex and not in your husband. When you go to work and you got to tell your, your, your work spouse, you shouldn't have a work spouse, but, and, and, and you can be more open with your work spouse, instead of your spouse at home, you don't have a foundation for your marriage. 
And a lot of us are off step with our foundation. So let's see if we could, let's see what happens with Richie. <laughs> so I'm gonna do it for you. Okay, so left, right, left, right, left, right, left, okay? Now you're gonna do it alone. Ready? One, two, three. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left. He's still a little off. He's still a little off. Let's give him one more try. Listen, listen to my voice. Don't count in your head. Listen to my voice. See, the issue is we go back to our head instead of to the voice of God. Your rhythm ain't his rhythm. Your mind ain't his mind. Amen? Listen for his voice. Ready? One, two, three. Left, right, left, right, left, right. His right is hitting instead of his left. Anybody been in the military? Okay, you come over here because I know you'll get it right. He's already been broken. Come on, Omar. Okay, do I need to do it with you? It's up to you. Oh, it's up to me. Okay. Okay, it's up to me. I just want to give you a hint. You should always let God do it with you. Because right now we're, we're, we're practicing, right? I'm giving an example. So for the purposes of the example, I'm God. But he's going to do it without God. No, you said whatever. <laughs> okay, he repented, so I'll do it with him. You see how quick you repent and God comes right back. Okay, you ready? One, two, three. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Okay, so we'll do it from here. Now you're gonna do it alone. Ready? One, two, three. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Okay, come on. All right, I'm gonna just let you do it because you've done this before. See, you've obeyed God before, but the question is do you continue to obey God? Because sometimes, I'm not really asking you. <laughs> <laughs> keep it real, keep it real, baby. Come on. All right, ready? One, two, three. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, left. Ready? One, two, three. One, two, left, right, left. Come on. One, two, three. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Okay? Yo, yo, come on. So now watch this. Get in the line right here. So it's one thing to obey God on your own, but we're a body. Are we a body? Are you a body? Okay. No pressure. I like the way y'all did that. Y'all went from short to tall. All right. Y'all ready? One, two, three. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, left, right, go back. One, two, three. Left, right, left, right, left, right. So you see how they can't do it together? That's what we look like as a body. Because one is obeying God and the other one isn't. Because one half obeying God and the other one tries to obey God. But nobody's really obeying God. And so we're trying to take a region, but we can't even move together. We're trying to take a region, but we're in competition with each other when we each have our own lane. We're trying to take a region, but our foundation isn't right, so we don't even know how to walk in the things of God by the Spirit. We've got to get our foundation right. Okay, I want him. You guys are good. Thank you. Thank you. So, so now think about it from this perspective. Adam was the foundation. From Adam, what was he supposed to do? He was supposed to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and take dominion. Right? And so Adam was the foundation. Adam sinned. When Adam sinned, the foundation was broken. So now, whatever follows can't follow properly. 
So as soon as we make a mistake, we cause others around us to make a mistake. And we've got to begin to understand that because you were not called unto yourself, you were called unto others. You were called unto salvation, but your salvation is for others to see the glory of the Lord. Your salvation is so that others can come to know his kingdom. Your salvation is so that his kingdom can be expanded. So what are you doing? You are building. See, we're not just building a church, but you're building a house. The Bible refers to a house in different things. The Bible refers to a house as your life. The Bible refers to a house as your family, as a ministry, and as society or the culture that we live in, a house. So when you are building your house, that's, this is why, what does God say in Timothy? That if you're going to be a deacon, if you're going to be an elder, if you're going to be a bishop, your house has to first be in order. Why? Because before you can build the house of your family, you have to build the house of your individual life. Before you can build the ministry, you have to have your individual life and your family. And before you can impact culture with your ministry, your house got to be right. So we're building a house. You're being purified so that whatever foundation you have that is not of Christ can be removed and he can add what is of the kingdom to your foundation. How do we build foundation? Matthew 7, 24 to 27 is going to be our main scripture, but I'll go to some other ones. And I'm going to try to do this quick because Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Matthew 7, 24. There you go. So number one today, two foundations. Two people, both building a house, a life, a family, a ministry, a contribution to society or culture. It says, so everyone who hears these words of mine. Can I ask you a question? Everyone in the room, can you hear these words of mine? And acts on them. Will you act on them? That's the, that's the question. And acts on them will be like a wise man, a far-sighted, practical, and sensible man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods and torrents came and the winds blew and slammed against that house, yet it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, in other words, does not act upon them, will be like a foolish, stupid man. That's the Bible. Please don't get offended and leave the church today. The Bible calls that foolish man stupid. Will be like a foolish, stupid man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods and torrents came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell. And great and complete was its fall. Listen, no matter what we're building, we must build something of substance. No matter what we're building, it's got to be something of significance and value. No matter what we're building, we need to make sure that we're building according to the kingdom of God. And so we must determine which of these two foundations are we building. Which of these two foundations are we laying so that we can build our life, so that we can build our family, so that we can build the ministry that God has placed us in, so that we can build whatever it is that he's put in our hearts so we can contribute to this culture. Because let me tell you something, this culture needs people like us who love Jesus and can bring the kingdom of God on the scene. Amen? Amen. Let's go to Habakkuk 2, 1 through 3. Habakkuk 2, 1 through 3. I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the tower, and I will keep watch to see what he will say to me. Anybody watching to see what God is saying to them? See, you got to watch. Anybody here a couple of Thursdays ago when Prophet was teaching that? You got to watch and see. 
If you're not watching, you're going to miss what God is trying to show you. And what answer I will give as his spokesman when I am reproved. In other words, he's go you got to be watching and seeing, and he might come back to you and correct you on some things. What kind of answer are you going to give him? Are you going to be like most people who in church get offended when the preacher preaches something that's directly hitting their heart? Or will you take the reproof and say, yes, Lord, I'll change. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and engrave it plainly on clay tablets so that the one who reads it will run. For the vision is yet for the appointed future time. It hurries towards the goal of fulfillment. It will not fail. Anybody got vision in this house? Even though it delays, wait patiently for it because it will certainly come. It will not delay. Listen, to build a house, you've got to have vision. To build a house, you've got to have a dream. To build the house, you need instruction. Amen? God expects us to have vision. If you have no vision of the things that God has for your life, then I declare that your eyes are open now in Jesus' name. I declare that your vision is restored. If you've been seeing blurry, if you've been confused about what you're seeing, I declare right now in Jesus' name that you are seeing clearly and that all things through Christ can be seen according to those that love him. Do you love him? Yes. Amen? Amen? Let's go to Acts 2.17. And it shall be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all. This is why I love our worship team, because they didn't know I was going to go to this scripture, yet they were talking about the outpouring. See, the spirit of God is moving. So I'm studying last night, putting this message together. My wife is this morning praying here that the service goes according to the spirit of God. And the worship team comes in and they start talking about an out, or singing, I should say, about an outpouring. It's because the Spirit of God, we are one body and the Spirit of God is marching together to one tune. I got it last night while I was praying, Lord, what do you want me to preach? Uh, my wife got it this morning while she was praying, Lord, make sure the house is filled with your presence uh, and that only your will be done. And then the worship team comes in and says, Lord, give me something because I want to do what you want me to do. And they begin to sing about the outpour you see that's a left right left right uh, in single formation uh, the body moving uh, according to the way the body is supposed to move but we got to take it further than the worship we've got to take it further than my office uh, further than the office of the prophet further than the worship team we've got to begin to take this into the streets uh, as the body of Christ uh, who's called uh, to bring the kingdom of God everywhere we go amen Has anybody been dreaming? Has anybody been having visions in this place? Anybody been thinking about their purpose? See, godly vision includes godly purpose. And it's not just for your life, but it's for the life of those around you. You know why God wants to heal you? So that you can represent him as his healer. See, God will heal you to expand his kingdom, but then, then you got to go beyond yourself and realize that my testimony will release the same healing power every time I testify. And you've got to know when you're around people because they'll come a bubbling up in your spirit. They'll come a bubbling up in your soul. And all of a sudden, you just got to talk about what God has done for you. And when you got to talk about it, uh, all of a sudden the atmosphere begins to shift. Uh, and as the atmosphere begins to shift, uh, all of a sudden the presence of God uh, comes on the scene uh, and people are getting healed. Amen? Amen. Yes. We've all been created to see visions and dreams. And it's interesting how, it, it's interesting because God says, I will pour out my spirit the young men will have vision and the old men will have dreams. You know, a man without a vision, a man without a dream is a man without hope. And I pray that all the men in this house have vision for their families. I pray that all the men in this house have a dream for this region. I pray that all the men in this house would have something on the inside of them to touch this nation. 
Because let me tell you, if you just touch one person, you've touched this community. If you just touch two people, you're starting to touch this state. And, and God wants men to arise. It, it, it's so heavy in my heart because there is an emasculating of men going on in this nation. You can see it at every level, at every mountain, even in the church. People think that only women pray. That's a lie from the pits of hell. Men are supposed to be praying. People, you know, you, you see the woman giving first instead of the man. Men, you're supposed to get up and give. Men are builders. Men will go to battle to build. But ladies, let me tell you something. You better stop putting your man down because every word that comes out of your mouth is releasing life or death. And if you want your man to arise to the occasion, you better stop talking about him. You better stop putting him down. You better stop smirking. You better start, stop releasing rebellion in your children by not having them do what he's asking them to do. Because that's, that's what happens. Daddy asks for something and mommy says, it's okay, don't worry about it. You know what you're doing? You're telling your children that they don't have to obey their father. And you're teaching them that one day they don't have to obey the Lord. Because the Lord is their father. That gets me righteous anger because it happens a lot. I watch it. I watch fathers say something and, and women back talk their husband. How do you back talk? You don't say it to him. You say it behind his back to the children. Mm -hmm. That's right. And what you're doing is you're taking away their authority and you're teaching your child that authority doesn't matter. You, got, you can have mama CDs because you don't need God. So think about these two men. Let's go back, right? Let's go back to Matthew 7. So everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man. And then if you go to the next one, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them. So they were all hearing the same words. They were all, in a sense, attending the same church. They were all at the same mount with Jesus, all of them. So, so they were in the same church, hearing the same word, and this word came directly from Jesus. Right? And they all went through the same storm. Because it says, in verse 25, and the rain fell and the floods and torrents came and the winds blew and slammed against that house, yet it did not fall. Because it had been founded on the rock. Then, then, then you go back, go, keep going, and it says, And the rain fell, and the floods and torrents came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell. So what's the difference? They heard the same word. They were attending the same church. They listened to the same preacher. But one has a house that won't fall, and the other one has a house that falls. One is wise, and one is foolish. One is wise and one is foolish. Both had vision, both had a dream. Both were believers willing to hear the word of God. <laughs> and they both lived in the same region because the storm affected the both of them the same, exactly, exactly the same. Both had negative events, both troubled with tribulation. Tribulation at the same caliber. You know, a storm is always looking to knock you down. A storm is always looking to set you up for failure. A storm is always looking to cause you to run. See, if it can knock you down emotionally, right, you'll fall down physically. Because boy, do we let our emotions control us. And once we fall down physically, we'll run. We become runners. Well, we like run, 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 run. And what happens, we run from our problem. We run from our situation. But, but th this is what I want you to understand. See, you, you get knocked out emotionally to fall down physically to run in the spirit. In other words, you start responding in the natural instead of responding in the spirit. And it's all based on your foundation. Which foundation are you building off of? Because I'm here to tell you today, when you follow Jesus, the storm's going to come. 
it will rain. As a matter of fact, it needs to rain. Because if the rain don't come, the harvest don't come. See, see, the rain causes the soil to release what you need so that you can propel through the dirt, through the storm. Isn't that what happens? You put a seed in the ground, it dies. When it dies, the rain comes, it gives it nutrients. The nutrients cause it to begin to grow. It rains again and the nutrients begin to cause it to grow even more. And as it begins to grow, what is it doing? It's searching for the light of day. It's searching to get out from darkness and get into the light. You see, there are things that you're dying to, but you're not striving to get into the light. You're staying in the darkness because you have emotionally fallen. You have physically fell down and you are spiritually running from the things of God. Who are you? Which one of these people are you? Are you the wise one or the foolish one? We've all been cleansed, purified unto holiness to build his house. A life impacting the lives of others for Jesus. A family positioned for his glory, testifying to other families. A contributor who builds a ministry that he has placed you in and a moral citizen contributing to the culture of our society today. <laughs> Will you be fruitful? Will you multiply? Will you fill the earth and take dominion? Because that's what God is calling us to do. Number two today, and we're going to go with Matthew 7, 24 and 26, the wise one or the foolish one, which one are you? And so everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man, a farsighted, practical, and sensible man. You know, I like that word right there, farsighted, because what it means is that you understand that your future is contingent upon that word. See, some of us are going through what we're going through because we don't understand that the word we received last year was contingent upon us doing it so that it can impact our future. And so we're still waiting for something that could have came a long time ago and you think that it's God and you're blaming God and you're blaming the people around you and you're blaming your leaders and you're blaming your mentor and you're blaming the apostle and you're blaming the prophet and they don't see me and they see this person and how come they don't see me? And blah, 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 blah. Right? When, when God is waiting for you. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. Because you heard the same word that the person heard that you're judging yourself against. Or I'll say it in a better way that you're competing with. You heard the same word. As a matter of fact, most, most if, if you came to this church and you got prophesied within the first two visits of coming to this church, stand up. Let me go up here. Right? So, so look at all of these people. They came here and within two visits, they were prophesied to. Now, are you all in the same place? Are you all where you should be? No, right? Why? You've all heard the same word. You all received the rhema word of God. So you should be further than wherever you're at right now. Or maybe some of you are right where you need to be, right? Maybe some of you just got here, and so I need to let you run. Don't worry, I'm going to get you to run. <laughs> but, but just look around the room. You can see how everybody's in a different place. No competition, no judging, okay? But everybody's in, you, 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 know, you know Juan back there with the, with the black and yellow, he looked like a bumblebee today. <laughs> oh, it's purple? Oh, it's blue? Look black from here, don't worry. You look beautiful though, don't worry about it. Right? You know, if there's one, you, you can be seated. If there's one thing I can say about Juan, is, is Juan is, very, is one of the very few men, young men I should say, let me keep it like that, young men, who not only does he tell me he wants my counsel, but he follows up with me, he calls me, he looks for me, he, he tries to go to lunch with me. If, if I don't respond to his text, he just texts me the next day, he don't care. He just keeps on. But, but you wanna know what he's showing me? That is that he's striving for the kingdom of God to come. Amen. See, some of us quit way too soon. See, he received a word when he came to this house, a rhema word. And as he strives, you want to know what he's doing with that word? He's causing that word to breathe. 
He's causing that word to come alive. He's causing that word to walk on the earth as he strives for the kingdom of God to come. That's what he's doing. So which one are you? Are you the wise one or are you the foolish one? The difference is in the foundation for these two people that I'm talking about today where one house was blown away and the other one was not. The interesting thing it says, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish stupid man who has built, who built his house on the sand. Can we go to verse 27 of that? Because I like the ending of it. Because this is what we don't understand. Right? If you go to the end there, it says, and, and the rain fell on the, and the floods and torrents came and the winds blew and slammed against the house and it fell and great and complete was its fall. See, when you have a foundation out of sand, great and complete will be your fall. We need to make sure we're building on the rock. We need to make sure that we're like a wise master builder building on the rock, on the foundation. Amen? Who, who, who builds a wall or places windows or a roof on a house that has no foundation? Anybody ever seen a hut? You know, on TV? Anybody seen a hut? Y'all act like y'all don't watch TV, man. Sometimes I wonder about you guys. You know that hut? has no foundation, it's just right on the ground. They didn't do anything to the foundation, so when it rains, rain gets into the hut because the rain just finds its way because there's no foundation that brings it above the ground. And a hut is taken away immediately, right? But when you have a foundation, you're lifted up. When you have a foundation, all of a sudden, the earth begins to lift you up and set you up into high places. You see, there's high places that God is trying to take you to, but until your foundation is right, you can't even match that principality that's in that high place that you need to get rid of. Foundation is crucial because it's not only which you, that which you can build from, but it's also that which you will battle from. It's also that which you will battle from. If we go to 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 20, I, I, I want you to understand that there are people that are deceived and yet they're still building. See, a house on sand uh, is, is a weak house. The, the sand is gathered quickly and it's laid quickly. They compact the sand and as soon as it rains, that compacting needs to be compacted some more. So anything that's been built on it begins to fall because the sand itself is going further and further into the ground. Anybody ever build a sand castle on the beach? Yeah. Could you imagine building a house on that sand? Can you fasten anything to that sand? Can you cause anything to be stable on that sand? Where's your foundation? See, when you fasten to the rock, you become one with the rock. When you screw a screw into the rock, you become like the rock. All of a sudden, you, become, you get so close. It's an intimate bonding that causes not only safety, but it also causes you to be rooted in a thing. It's the same like being engrafted. 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool, discarding his worldly pretensions and acknowledging his lack of wisdom, so that he may become truly wise. In other words, worldly wisdom is not greater than godly wisdom. 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness, who builds on a foundation of sand? The foolish one. Absurdity, stupidity before God. For it is written in scripture, he is the one who catches the wise and clever in their craftiness. 
See, a rock costs more. It takes more time to build on a rock. A rock's got to be cut. It's got to be measured. It's got to be molded so that it can be precise. Because when you put the house on the rock, you've got to make sure it's graded properly. you got to make sure that everything is the way it's supposed to be so that when the rock comes up, it comes up with integrity. It comes up standing tall. It comes up standing straight. Too many of us want to build on sand because we want things quickly. We want, we want our house. We want our family. Oh, we, we'll tell everybody our family's great on Facebook, uh, but if I walk into your house today, I wonder if it's really great. See, a lot of people are building their foundation in Facebook. And, and the crazy thing is, is that these people are building foundations in Facebook and everybody believes it. Everybody believes it. Apostle, everybody believes what they see on Facebook. They think, they forget that those two minutes are not a representation of the other 23 hours and 58 minutes of the day. But boy, we believe Facebook. <laughs> some of you believe Facebook more than you believe the Bible. Some of you, some of you will go and buy clothes, will go and buy food. Some of you will change your style based on what Facebook says or Instagram or whatever y'all watch today. Because I think Facebook is already old, right? Just a little bit? Okay. My wife and I were talking uh, yesterday, right? Everybody wants to do, uh, um, I don't know what you call that stuff. You know, but, but yeah, all that, I'm not even gonna say it because then that's gonna offend people. Yeah, let me not say that. Okay, so, so, <laughs> see, a wise man puts in what it would take to cut the rock, mold the rock, drill the rock, build on the rock. But a foolish man, he just wants to hurry up, hurry up, hurry up and build. I, hurry up, I, I need to be a preacher. Hurry up, hurry up. I'm called to be a preacher. But, but all you do is talk. And all your actions don't match your talk. And I'm here to tell you today, your talk is cheap. Your talk is cheap. Desperate people wanting a house that they can't even sustain. Because the truth is, they need deliverance. The truth is, their family needs deliverance. The truth is, they, if they opened up a ministry, it would be nothing but a ministry of demons and devils. And what, what that song goes, demons and devils and demons and devils on track, right? I don't know. That's what I heard in my head. I don't know what that is. Because some of you think you're talking to spirits of God and you're not. See, one's foundation must be worthy of the structure, the house, the life, the family, the ministry, the culture that you build upon it. And so integrity is key. You can't have a big building on a small foundation. See, many want God to do big things in their lives, but they only have the foundation of a hut. And guess what? That's no foundation at all. Many people believe that they're called to ministry, but they can't even connect to a house of ministry. Many people think that they're prophets, but they won't submit to a prophet. Many people think they're apostles, but they won't submit to apostles. People think they're pastors, but boy, do they give their pastor a hard time. And yet the Bible says uh, to make sure that those who lead you are happy with you. I told the men yesterday, I said, do you really want congregants like yourself? It got mighty quiet in this church. <laughs> Are you building on sand or on the rock? What are you building on? What are you building on? The rock or the sand? Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12. Number three, the rock or the sand. Which foundation have you laid? For the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing, and effective. Oh, my goodness. Did, did you hear that? The word of God is living and active and full of power. Making it operative, energizing, and effective. So if you come to church and you're tired, 
you might need to get some word into you. Because the word is energized. If you're struggling in your family, you might need to get some word in you. Because it's operative. It can help you operate your family. If you're struggling in your finances, you might need to get some word in you. Because his word is effective. And you're not effective if you're broke. Last time I checked... You, you can't pay your bills. You can't pay your mortgage if you're broke, let alone help somebody. So the Bible says, if you ask your brother if he's cold and he says that he's not, what good are you if you don't give him a blanket? In other words, you can't ask somebody how they're doing and then not help them. Come on. Hmm. <laughs> Which foundation have you laid? Are you a doer of the word? Are you a doer of the word you hear and the word you preach? Is the word living, breathing? Is it in and flowing through you? Or is it just information? It is sharper than any two-edged a sword penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit. Why does it separate your soul and your spirit? Because it's separating your carnality from your spirit, man. So it's got to separate your soul from your spirit. The completeness of a person and, and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. The difference between the wise and foolish man was the ability to act on the words they heard. And I'm going to say that again. The difference between the wise and the foolish man was the ability to act on the words that they heard. I believe that, we're li that we live in a society today that we pick and choose whether we're going to believe the preacher that's preaching in the house that God has called us to. I believe we live in a society today where we no longer understand that that preacher spent time with God so he could bring the word that you need to hear. When we're supposed to come to church so that we can hear the Lord and then do what he's telling us to do. See, the difference between the wise and the foolish man wasn't that they went to different churches because they went to the same church. It wasn't that they heard a different message because they heard the same message. Wasn't that the preacher was different because it was 11, uh, a 10 o'clock service and not a 1.30 service because Jesus preached the same message. Amen. The difference was one was a doer of the word and the other one was not. And some of us spend so much time trying to find what's wrong in the word that we're hearing that we never hear the word that God is trying to release in our lives. Some of us spend so much time, well, well, did he say that right? Or was that, well, well I don't know if prophet, she, she said that in prophet. I don't agree with what prophet said because, you know, this is what I know. And, and what you don't know is that because you were sitting there to judge the word instead of to receive the word, the enemy snatched the word while it was in the air before it got to your ear and he changed it and you didn't even hear what everybody else heard. That's right. Because the enemy is like a bird who snatches the seed while it's in the air so that before the seed even gets to your heart, it's already been changed, cha shifted. It's already another seed that wasn't the seed that God was releasing because your attitude, your heart motive was wrong. That's good. See, hearing the word may build your faith, but... The word is only active, living, breathing, and being formed in you when it's acted upon. That's what, what does the Bible say? Faith without works is dead. So faith comes by hearing the word, but faith is dead if you're not doing the word. So a lot of us are walking around with dead faith. Because your faith is in what you want. And what you have told yourself, not in what God wants and what God has told you. I know it's a harsh word, but we've been purified and cleansed. And don't you want to keep it? This is the truth. This is the truth. Right? 
This is what's happening in society today, right? I mean, you, you know, <laughs> boy, do I want to give a lot of examples, but I'm refraining. I'm refraining from giving examples. Because you, you know what amazes me? Is that I know it's happening right here amongst us. But you sit there and act like it ain't you. Like if you're perfect. When God is trying to perfect you. You look at me like I'm crazy. But, but, but let somebody come up here and say that grace is the ability for you to do what you cannot do and you're amening all over the place. But let me tell you that that grace ain't going to work unless you walk out the word and you don't know what to tell me. I don't preach a hyper grace. If you're sinning, okay, you, you, listen, Apostle Rennie said it real clear. Okay, if you're being transformed, you may sin within that transformation process and you're okay. But if you're just a sinner who keeps sinning and doing the same thing, you're going to hell. See, now when Apostle Reddy said that, y'all jumped up and said amen. When I say it, you go. <laughs> Faith without works. Without action is dead. Information is not going to get you to heaven. Information is not going to release the supernatural over your life. Information is not going to get you from broke to prosperity. Information isn't going to change your marriage. Information isn't going to get your kids safe. Information is not going to do whatever it is that you need to do. It's the word that becomes alive, active, breathing in your life. How does the word become alive? How does it begin to breathe? How does it begin to be active in your life when you do the word when you do the word it becomes alive when you do the word it starts to breathe when you do the word it begins to speak the blood when you do the word it begins to release holy ghost when you do the word when you do the word see see you know i i, I love i love my hip-hop guys i love them Okay, now I'm a Sugar Hill fan. Not dirty, tricky Mike today, you know what I mean? I don't even understand the words that they say today. This is what I hear. That's what I hear in rap today. Like, what are they saying? I, my dad, we were in Zach's car the other day. He's driving, and my dad goes, Zach, do you even understand what they're saying? Because me and my dad didn't understand what in the world was going on. But he said he understood. But I love my hip hop guys because I, I believe one day, you know, we're going to do some things with that and those, uh, that genre and, and those people, right? Um, because we need to impact that culture. So please, don't misunderstand me. All right? But a lot of you have a lot of information and no action. And you think you're walking by faith because you could put a word together and rhyme it. Or make a story out of something and it, it sounds good. But the truth of the matter is, and, and I'm, I'm saying this because I want to help you. Because I've seen too many of you go back to the weed, go back to the cocaine, go back to the clubs, go back to all the nonsense. Because you can convince yourself with just information that you can do all that stuff and still glorify God. But you can't. Because the truth is, if you're really transformed, God will bring you peace, not weed. If you're really transformed, you don't need to get high on cocaine. You can get high on the Holy Ghost. If you're really transformed, you got brothers and sisters in the church. You don't need to go find hoodlums and rappers in the club. If you're really transformed. Really. Because you know it's easy to take a couple of words that the preacher says and sound holy. Because today people are deceived. They don't even know what holiness is anymore. I love you, hip hoppers. <laughs> but you know, that's a genre that should be winning people to Christ. But instead, they've taken iron sharpens iron 
and cause it to be weed for weed. That's, right. That's what they've done. And girl for girl. And they go around and they act like, like, like they know it all because they can put a rap together, but they're not really living for Christ. Christianese ain't going to cut it. You know what Christianese is? You try to talk and walk like Jesus, but you can't because it ain't real. You got to decide if you're going to be a doer. That is to take the word and apply it to your life's choices by your actions. It's only activated when we apply it in our lives. That's it. You know, I, 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 it, it drives me insane. Men who don't congregate with other men in the church. But then you see them congregating with people. Why is it that you can't congregate with holy men, but you can congregate with other men? Because spirits attract the same spirit. And baby, if you ain't attracted to me, and God called you to this house, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Because you can't be called to one house and build another. How did, Marcus, how does that work? Marcus, can you be in Tampa building a house and then build my house here in St. Cloud? That would be difficult, wouldn't it? Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Because if you're deceived, you won't even know it. And you'll start to build. And your, your house will be greatly and completely destroyed. That ain't no joke. That's no joke. My wife and I, we've seen it. Plenty of people who don't want to go to the process. Some of you see them because you come and report it to me. You come and you tell me, you know who I saw? I saw the, he was, and he was drinking and he was smoking. And he was in the gas station and I saw him and then he tried to hide it from me. Completely and greatly destroyed. Families being destroyed because parents are building under the deceit, the guise of the enemy. And we're not, I want you to know something. Redemption isn't perfect, nor is it the only church. But if you're called to it, you'll be perfected in it. If you're called to it, it will be your church. If you're called to it, you will be called. You, you, there's, there's two types of people in the house. There are people that are called to us because they're called to the house. And there are people that are called to us because they're called to be our sons and daughters. And my wife and I understand that. And we don't got an issue with either one of them. But you can't just be called here to be called somewhere else. That's right. You, you, you can't come here to receive but you're called to somebody else. That, it doesn't work that way. They, because you, you have to understand, Jesus is in this house. And we are a part of the body. So let's say we're the pinky. Right? Because I don't think of us great. So we, we're the, the pinky toe. Even, even smaller. Right? Anybody can move their pinky toe right now? Nope, you got to move all the other toes. You can't just move the pinky toe by itself. Right? I'm trying right now, man. I can't do it. I'm trying right now. So, so we're not great. We're not great. But if, if you're called to this house and you're connected to the elbow of the church down the street, then you're not going to get from the pinky toe what you need for your life right now. I just want you to get what you need. Amen. Maybe you're not called to stay here forever. Maybe you're called to be a pastor in this house. Maybe you're called to be sent out to be an evangelist. Maybe you're called to be sent out to be a pastor. I, I, listen, whatever it is, I pray that you connect properly so that you can get what you need to get what God has for you. 
because you can't you can't be engrafted to the head unless you connect to the head if you're connected to another head you're getting something totally different than what God had for you totally different and so what ends up happening because it's not what God has for you you are now in worldly wisdom you're in your own wisdom so you're actually building on sand instead of on the rock why because God said okay um, Omar right no let's not go with Omar I, I gotta go with, I gotta go with somebody okay Stephen back there in the back no let's not go with Stephen <laughs> Joseph if he gets offended he's my son-in-law I could beat him up <laughs> Joseph was in the shower one morning and the Lord told him, go to redemption. We didn't call him. We didn't ask him to come. As a matter of fact, you know, they cut us completely off when they were going to another church. You did. Don't worry about it. It's okay. I love you. Are you a leader in the house now? Yes. So don't worry about it. Don't, girl, don't make me take you to the lion's den right now. <laughs> that, that's my daughter. We're family. It's okay. See, if I do that with them, imagine. So, so Joseph is told to come. So he starts coming to prayer. He starts getting connected. Everything inside of him starts to come alive, right? Why? Because he's, he's, he is doing what he knows to do to get engrafted. He's connecting because he knows, because he ain't stupid. We went to Bible college together, by the way, Joseph and I. Okay, we went to Bible college. We went on a missions trip. He dressed like Spider-Man. I, I refuse to put the Spider-Man outfit on. I still have the pictures too to embarrass him one day in the future. Right? So, so he comes to prayer. He starts coming to church. And he just starts going 100%. Right? He's engrafted. He starts getting things. His business turns around. Um, all of a sudden, he's, I, I think that year he doubled his income or something like that. And now it just keeps growing. But every now and then, Joseph wants to cut himself off. And what happens? He begins to get frustrated. He begins to get weary and tired. Because he tries to engraft himself someplace that he should not be. So he's not, you see, how many of you know that there are different sizes of veins inside of you? There are different types of arteries inside of you. As a matter of fact, this one here is like, you can help me, right? Where's the biggest one? The one that goes to your brain, right? Your, your carotid, is that what it's called? Okay. The carotid is the biggest one, right? So, so think about it like this. If you're supposed to be connected to, to redemption, and, and that means that where you're carotid. That's where you're going to get the most life from. That's where, that's where your blood is going to be rejuvenated from. Because I think, right, when it goes into the heart, there's oxygen stuff going on, and it cleanses, and it gets rid of compost, and then it, it delivers fresh stuff to the body again. Right? Okay, I know a little bit about the heart. Okay, right? So anytime Joseph disconnects himself, he connects to another vein someplace else, but he's not as close to them because he don't even know them. See, he's close to the head here, so he goes right to the carotid here. So anytime he disconnects from the carotid, he gets frustrated. He gets tired. He gets weary. He doesn't understand why certain things begin to happen in his business. He doesn't understand why Alexa's acting the way Alexa's acting. He, he, yeah. I've never talked to him about this before, but let's look at Joseph and see if I'm right. <laughs> okay? So, so, and then, as soon as God... Smacks him up a couple of times, okay, and, and shakes him up, and he gets connected again. He doesn't, he, he, he doesn't come in looking like, like, I won't say what he looks like, but he comes in looking refreshed. He comes in looking new. He comes in looking like he had a good night's rest. He comes in looking like his eyes are totally different, because you know the eyes are the window to the soul. And all of us, and, and my wife will look over at me and say, Joseph has changed. But we know 
when he's connected to the carotid of the house and when he's not. We know when you are connected to the carotid of the house and when you're not. And when you're not, you begin to build on a foundation called sand because it's, you're doing it in rebellion. You're doing it because you're allowing the, the mindset of the world, the wisdom of the world, of your flesh, to dictate what you're going to do instead of what God told you to do. And so you want rest, but you can't get rest. You want peace, but you're frustrated. It's because you're connected to the wrong thing. You've got to be connected to what God has told you to be connected to. See, when you connect right, they'll send you off right. <laughs> you cannot mix rock with sand. God's wisdom with man's wisdom is no wisdom at all. Strange fire is the way the Bible calls it. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 11. I'm going to try to close with this. According to the remarkable grace of God, which was given to me to prepare me for my task. How many of you have a task? You have grace. There's grace in your life. Like a skillful master builder, I laid a foundation. How do you lay the foundation of Christ? By doing his word. You see, think about this. Every time somebody says the word is living, breathing, powerful, like a double-edged sword that will pierce the soul and the spirit of a man. What do you think of? Like, what do you think of? Do you see a sword maybe in the spirit that comes to cut? Can I tell you something today? You're the sword. Your choice is the sword. You're having a vision of the sword, but the vision will not manifest until you make a choice to separate your will from the will of God and do his will. That's how his word becomes living. That's how his word becomes active. The difference between the wise man and the foolish man is one of them acted on the words that they heard. It's time redemption. You've been cleansed. You've been purified. You know what holiness is. You know we're called to this region. So why are some of you still being held back? Because of your actions. You're building on sand instead of on the rock. Because you, you're hearing the word, but you're not doing the word. You're hearing what you want to hear, but you're only regurgitating it. You're not living it. It's time for us to live the word of God. It's time for us to come out of the word. How many of you know the Bible says that the lust of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life are the three things that will get us in trouble? So, so, so you know what you got to do? When you are getting ready to do something, is that the lust of the flesh? Is that the desire of the eye? Is that the pride of life? Or is this God? You've got to start judging what you do against those things so that you can make sure that you're doing what God has called you to do. And, and when you know that you're doing what God has called you to do, then you know that you're causing his word to become active. See, if your prayers aren't being answered, stop looking around you and start looking at you. If you say, but this word, prophet keeps saying this, and prophet keeps saying that, but it ain't working for me, it's you. That's right. It's you. Because you're not acting on the word that you're hearing. Well, prophet said that, you know, so, so this is what happens. Right? Prophet will talk to somebody. I'll talk to somebody. And we'll tell them, well, you got to pray. So this is what they do. They go home and they pray for five minutes and then they forget about it. Let me tell you something. When prophet's mother was dying in the hospital, the Lord told me she needs to be in the hospital like if she's going to work. She needs to be in the hospital from 9 o'clock in the morning after she drops the kids off till 3 o'clock in the afternoon when she goes to pick the kids up because she needs her job is to pray for her mother and I will bring her back. 
I went, to my, I went to the hospital that day to tell my wife, and my wife told me, I, I feel like I need to come every day and fight for my mother. She, say again? And every hour, on the hour, she was praying for her mother. And I would be at work praying for her mother. And we didn't stop praying until we saw something. We didn't stop praying until her mother came. One day she's walking down the hallway and all the doctors are running to the room. And all of a sudden the woman that was supposed to be in a coma that wasn't supposed to come back uh, was awake. They started to move her. She started to move her hands. She started to move her legs. Uh, it, well, how many, what was it? 30 days, 45 days? Yeah. Two months in a coma. And they were telling us, you're going to have to make a decision. We didn't let certain people in the room because all they did was talk negativity. My wife was there to guard the room because we didn't want the words of death being spoken over her life. We started telling people, you can't, I don't care if you're Christian. You can't come in here because you don't know how to cause the word to be living and breathing and active to bring her back alive. We fought for those two months. For two months, we had to figure out how to feed the kids. For two months, we had to figure out how to pick up the kids, drop the kids off. For two months, my wife, we were all over the place. For two months, fighting for her mother's life. What did we do? We became the word that we knew. It wasn't just information. We weren't just saying, well, well if we pray, she'll come back to life. Well, I hope my pastor's praying for her. Well, no, I ne we never once went to the pastor and said, it's your responsibility to pray for her mother. The Lord told her, wake up before the sun rises. So she would wake up. And then one day, the, the, Lord, the Lord told me, um, you, you, you got to fast. She's got to fast. She's got to fast. So I told her she's got to fast. She was waiting for a word from the Lord. Somebody at the church came and told her, the Lord said, if you would fast on water for three days, she'll come back to life. On the third day, she came out of a coma. We fought for two months. Then they told us that she would never walk again. They told us she'll never walk. She'll never eat alone. She, she won't be able to talk right. Let me tell you something. Within, within 60 days, she was eating. She was walking. She was talking. She was hanging out with us. She was doing everything that she knew how to do. Because the word became living, active, and breathing. Not just in us, but through us. And you can do the same thing. You can do the same thing. You can do the same thing. According to the remarkable grace of God, which was given to me to prepare me for my task, like a skillful master builder, I laid a foundation and now another is building on it. But each one must be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. This is what the Lord told me. Brian, I'm perfecting people into the image of my son. Because that's what makes the word come alive. So what is, how many of you know that the word became flesh? Jesus was the word that became flesh. When you act on his word, you are being perfected into his image because you're causing his word to become flesh. Understand me today. All things are possible for those who are wise and build the foundation on the rock. When things become impossible, check your foundation. Because when things are built on the sand, the storms will come and you'll be blown away. There's people that every time a storm comes, they wanna leave the church, right? I can't tell you, you know, at least once a month, sometimes twice a month, I get a text. Oh, I'm going to leave the church. Oh, I'm going to leave the church, right? Different people. You want to know why? Because their foundation is built on sand. So every time a storm comes, they're blown away. When you build on the rock, the storm will come and you can't get blown away. You can't get blown away. You cannot build what God has for you on the sand. It can only be built on the rock of his word. Wisdom is taking the responsibility for the grace to apply God's truth to your realities. 
Foolishness is the refusal to apply the grace of God's truth to your life's realities. Wisdom is taking the responsibility for the grace to apply God's truths to life's realities. Foolishness is the refusal to apply the grace of God's truths to life's realities. In other words, when you're wise, you apply the word of God. When you're foolish, you apply yourself. And it's time for us to apply the word of God. Amen? Amen. James 1, if you guys go home and study this on your own, but if you go to James, if you read James 1 and James 2, you'll understand really quick that God's word responds to your acts of faith. Not your thoughts, not the information you have in your head, not an idea or the words you speak. That's all sand. Don't let the storm cause you to forget his word. How many of you know Jesus said, let's go to the other side? And they got in a boat to cross the sea. And all of a sudden, a storm came. And when the storm came, they were like, Jesus, Jesus. And they found Jesus asleep. He was at rest. He was at rest in the middle of a storm because his foundation was on the rock. See, at that point, the disciples' foundation was still on the sand and they began to panic in the midst of the storm. But Jesus knew that it didn't matter the storm, his house, his life, his family, his ministry, his position and culture would not be swayed, would not be moved because he had built everything he had done up to that point on the rock. Our rock is Jesus Christ. And when we take his word and we live out his word in everything that we do, it doesn't matter the storm that will come. Not only will your prayers be answered, but there'll be no storm that'll be able to take away the blessings of God from your life. God wants to bless you. God wants to build. You see, your father in heaven is looking for sons that will build his house. He wants to build your, your life. He wants to build your family. He wants to give you grace to help you build the, the ministry that he's placed you in. And he wants you to have a position in this culture that'll bring change to glorify his son, Jesus. But you have to make a choice. Will you become a doer of his word? Will you allow his word to be living, breathing, active on the inside of you to the point where everything you do is according to his word and brings him glory? A lot of you, when this is what happens, you love God, and I, I know you love God, and I know you come because you want more of God, but when you go out there, you're making decisions based on the, the wisdom of the world, based on the wisdom of your flesh, based on the wisdom of your old man, and God is saying today, stop with those decisions and start making decisions based on his spirit, because it's not about what you want, it's about what God is telling you to do. It's not about what you think. It's about what God knows. See, he knows your end way better than you think you know your end. He's known you since the beginning, and he's trying to help you get to that place that he created on the earth just for you. But we must obey his voice. You do it. I showed you the individual who couldn't obey his voice. I showed you the individual that could. I showed you how as a group, we must all begin to move forward as one body. What God wants to do in this house is going to require that we all begin to obey his word, that we all begin to do what God called us to do. There are many of you that you know you're living in sin right now, and you, you repented and you asked God to remove it and all that, but you keep living in that sin. I challenge you today. I charge you today to examine your life and take out the root of rebellion because that fruit is nothing but the fruit of your rebellion. It's the fruit of you not listening and obeying the word of God. Because when you do that, not only will your life change, but your family will change. And once your life and your family are changed, then you'll begin to change your position in this church. If this is where you've been called, which, by the way, you'll never see me and my wife beg you to stay in this church. We, we, we don't believe in that. We don't believe in chasing you because if we chase you once, we'll have to chase you all the time. 
you got to know God called you here and you got to want to stay in this house but 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 if you let him deal with your life and your family trust me when I tell you he'll make room for you on the earth right here in this house for whatever ministry is on the inside of you now when that happens he's going to tug and he's going to pull because how many of you know every time you enter a new season God's going to ask for something new because you're in, in a progressive state of being perfected which means that there are tears that are growing that he will not pull out until you're in that season so believe it or not when you got saved he pulled out tears but then when you shifted into a new season he pulled out more tears and when you shifted into the next season see because your level of maturity determines your next season but it just doesn't determine the blessings that come with that season it also determines the new tears that have to be pulled out that have been growing with you and God had known all along but because you were being transformed he allowed you to stay with that thing but now it's time to let it go now it's the Bible's very clear he let the weak grow to be strong before he pulls out the tears there are certain tears that he couldn't pull out in the last season that he's trying to pull out in this season because now you mature you've heard the word so God is asking you today will you breathe live and activate my word by doing what I'm asking you to do by removing the tears that have been sin in your life all along that he has actually he's actually had mercy on you see see perfection isn't what he's looking for he's looking to perfect us into the image of his son and so there's a new level of tears being torn out of your heart so that you can move according to your new season. I'll put it to you, come, come over here. Right, come over here, Hector. If, let's make, um, <laughs> Hector is going to be the mature wheat, right? And he's gonna be the tear that's been growing next to that wheat. This wheat is now in season to be harvested. In other words, there are new things, new sounds that God has placed in his belly that he's going to begin to, to allow to come forth. Okay, he's going to, God is going to begin to activate them. As, as Hector obeys, they're going to be activated. But this tear that has been there since the beginning, that has not been pulled out because this wheat was not strong enough. It was not mature. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Was not mature enough. Okay, yeah, there were some tears that were removed from your life over here when, in this old season. Okay, that's because the maturity level that you were at could no longer tolerate those tears. But it had to tolerate that tear over there because this tear couldn't come out until this level of maturity. So now, at, right, because over here you might have got offended. Over here, you might have left the church. Over here, you might have ran back to your old man. And so God having mercy on you, he allows that tear to stay. So now, now, now Hector's mature enough, right? He, he's mature enough. But how many of you know pride is going to still try to come? How many of you know, see, Hector, Hector's testimony is that he had a master's degree, so he didn't think he needed to work for anybody with an associate's degree. He didn't think he needed to work for anybody who didn't have a degree. He didn't understand why his wife could tell him something when he was the man with the master's degree, right? Am I right or wrong? So what is that? That's the pride of life. That's the pride of life. I'm better than everybody, right? So now, now he's an elder. Now he's preaching in the church. Do you think pride ain't going to try to come up again? Yes. Do you think that the enemy ain't whispering to him that he's better than everybody? Do you think the enemy ain't telling him, well, yeah, I've only been safe for this long and look at where I'm at already. Amen. Oh, let me tell you something. I, we ain't even had the conversation, but I know the devil is a liar. I know the devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy. I know the devil is trying to rob him of everything that God is trying to take from him. So this is what's happening right now in his life. Since I brought him up here, let's make it prophetic. Because you know everybody's going to think that way anyway. So now, this level of pride that's been with him all along that he's been hiding. This level of pride that he hasn't let anybody see. 
that has only come out in private because he's been real careful not to say anything he's been real careful how he talks about people he's been real careful how he deals with his wife in public he's been real careful how he talks to his kids he's been careful but he just got promoted he's just moved to a new level and so the tear wants to be seen the tear grew with his maturity the chair isn't much shorter than him. No, you think I'm, I'm not playing. That's the truth. The chair's been growing with him all along. The chair was never pulled out because he couldn't handle it. But now he's in a new season of his life where it's time to die to that pride, where the, where the pride of life must be removed from his heart if he's going to be taken to the next season one day, where the pride of life has to be removed from, a, from his heart if he's going to manifest the fullness of the season that he's in. He can't think himself better than anybody. He must be one who serves. He can't think he does more than everybody in the church. He can't think because he was chosen to preach at the 130 service that he's better than anybody. And so now it's time to pull this tear away. Don't, don't let him go. So God, I got to tell him because you know, he's going to do whatever I, I, I do. So I got to tell him don't do with me right now. So God begins to use me, begins to use my wife, begins to use out the vow to tell Hector, hey, hey, you better relax there, buddy. Hey. So what are we, what is God doing? God is trying to pull the tear away. God is trying to pull the tear away. But the only way that tear is going to be released is if Hector himself rips it off and says he doesn't want it. The moment, you see, see, because God is no respecter of person. God is not going to force you to do anything. The power is in your choice. So the moment Hector decides to remove the pride from his life, that's when God can move and operate in his life. That's when God can begin to bring the fullness of his new season to his life. Many of you have tears right now that God is trying to rip off your life. My question to you today is what foundation will you lay today in this service? Will you release the tears and build the foundation on the rock? Or will you hold on to them and build the foundation on sand? If you want to release the tears today, I just want you to stand right there where you're at. Hallelujah. Just lift up your hands. And right there where you're at. Maybe you've been building deceitfully on sand. Maybe you're not even sure. Whatever the case, I want you to repent before God. But what am I repenting of? You're repenting of building on a foundation that isn't the rock. Of repenting on building on a foundation that's of this world, of the flesh of your own carnal mind because it's time to lay a foundation that is nothing but the word the rock Jesus Christ so that we can build according to what he wants us to build and it would never be destroyed for what we build on the rock shall be eternal eternally bringing him glory eternally pleasing the father see the rewards we are not saved by works but surely the rewards that we receive in heaven though you, you see what you build on the rock today and is rewarded in heaven later is an eternal reward so you got to understand when you build on the rock when you build your life when you build your family when you build it, the ministry that God has called you to when you add to the culture of today the things the morality of God's kingdom those things will be rewarded in heaven and you will be given a reward that you will see no touch feel it will be tangible in heaven throughout eternity 
So when you build on the sand, it will fall. It will not make it to heaven. But when you build on the rock, you will be rewarded in heaven. So right there where you're at, as you, as you repent, I just want you to pray after me with your hand lifted high. Say, Father, today, if I have built on a foundation made of sand, I repent. And I ask you, Father, to open my eyes that I would not build deceitfully, but that I would build with the mind of Christ upon the rock, Jesus Christ, that I would build in such a way that I would bring you glory, that I would be connected to that carotid artery, to the very head that you have called me to uh, so that I can build according to your command that my life, my family, the ministry you've placed me in and the society that I live in will be glorified in your name. That everything I do will bring glory to you that I would operate according to the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. My life would be aligned with heaven. My family would be aligned with heaven. My ministry would be aligned with heaven. My actions and culture would be aligned with heaven. And everything I do will bring Jesus glory. Father, here I am. I've been purified. I've been cleansed. I want to be fruitful. I want to multiply. I want to fill the earth and take dominion for your kingdom cause. Let my foundation be in your word. I commit to being a doer of your word so that your word can become living, breathing, and active everywhere I go. I commit to you this day, my life, the living word of God. I thank you for it, and I thank you for the grace. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen.